For more discussion on China-German relations in Berlin, Ulrich Bruckner, who is a Jean Monnet professor for European studies with the Stanford University. In Beijing, Wang Yiwei, director of the Center for European Studies at Renmin University of China. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. With uh, Chancellor Schultz's visit to China, China-German relations once again is uh, becoming the hot topic for the world. Now, tell me more about what exactly it meant, uh, the nature of this relationship now, as you see it. Olaf Scholz is visiting China as one of the most important trading partners in times in which we see a number of challenges for the global order. We are um, having elections in the European Parliament in a few weeks from now, and we are expecting major decisions happening in Washington in November. So in the Western world, a lot of things will change, and this will not only affect future relations and the question whether we move more in a protectionist direction or restore globalization that used to be beneficial both for China and for Germany. What about the wind that you are feeling in Berlin right now? Which direction of the two that you just mentioned is it likely to blow? Germany totally understands that decoupling is not an option. But we have heard not only in Brussels, but also in the public discussion in Germany, that de-risking is of high importance because Germany lived three life lies that cheap security from the United States will last forever, energy imports from Russia will last forever, and a dependency on China when it comes to all kinds of products that we outsource to Asia and then re-import will last forever. So there is a need to de-risk and to diversify strategies. On the one hand, Olaf Scholz was reaching out to the Indo-Pacific, and Germany is much more engaged in different parts of the world in which it didn't pay as much attention as it currently does. But on the other hand, we see that China appears not necessarily as an enemy, but as someone who's not using its weight to stop Russia from killing Ukrainians. We also need to consider this in a bigger picture. I think we should clarify that China is not backing Russia on the behavior in Ukraine. China never recognized either the four states in Ukraine, even uh, Crimea, as a part of the Russia side. The China and the Russian relations have their own independent logic. And back to your question, China and German relations, of course, are one of the driving forces for the China-EU cooperation. Uh, you know, for a long time, China-German trade is one third of all the trade with uh, 27 member states of the European Union. At the same time, also the high technology cooperation, investment, and today for digital and green transformation, China and Germany is the natural partner. We see very interesting combination of phenomena. On the one hand, uh, Professor uh, Bruckner, the so-called uh, de-risking uh, to reduce uh, what some German call the dependency on Chinese uh, goods uh, uh, and uh, also diversifying. But at the same time, we also see German businesses increasing their investment in China and also working with uh, Chinese uh, counterparts on green technologies, even related to uh, electronic vehicles. And at the same time, China has been uh, once and again repeating its invitation for foreign investment, certainly including that from Germany. So how do you see these uh, three very different rhetorics, different directions, and different phenomena going on at the same time? What does that mean for Chancellor Schultz's um, articulation about the future directions uh, for China, Germany? Well, it highlights the complexity of the nature of this relationship. On the one hand, and that is not a question whether we like the term or not, we are partners because we are so mutually dependent economically from each other that the current economic situation can only be improved if we go back to what used to be a functioning system of globalization. Germany is an export nation, China is an export nation, and we greatly benefit from having good relations with each other. That is the partner side. The competitor side is that Germany is very much committed to international rules as WTO rules. 
and we believe in free markets and have accessible markets. China didn't used to have this in the same way. So Mr. Scholz is trying to convince China to create something like a level playing field, that if there are overcapacities in China that are channeled to the European markets, for example, with electric vehicles, then we expect the same to happen with China. And there are good signs that this is happening. And when we go back to the rival part, there are geopolitical changes in which China has all the reasons to question the Pax Americana, that we have a world order that is dominated by the United States that doesn't represent the current balance of power in the world, and therefore it wants to change the rules of the game. And this is a geopolitical threat or a challenge that is put into these categories. It's not meant to be an offensive term, but it describes the very different nature of the complex relationship. We see a combination, as Mr. Uh, Bruckner earlier indicated, the complexity of issues. So which angle of this complexity are you looking into and what does that mean for China-German relations regarding this, what many have been using, so-called de-risking? Well, so-called de-risking uh, uh, actually is the factor decouple, which specifically identify the de-risk from China, which is unfair. According to the uh, market principles and uh, economic rules, risk and opportunities always combine together, which uh, you cannot just uh, emphasize so it's called de-risk. Uh, otherwise, you also de-opportunities from Chinese market. Chinese market is uh, most dynamic and huge in, in the world, not the traditional, but also in the digital and the green market as well. So-called uh, de-risk and even consider about uh, so-called uh, anti subsidies of the China uh, electronic vehicles, which is unfair. The Chinese uh, comparative advantage in the economic vehicles is not because of the subsidies, actually, which China is a huge market, is a uh, most independent and complete categories of the industries, and also because of the Chinese uh, uh, in, uh, infrastructure. Uh, now it's uh, very high quality with the 5G, with the mutual connectivities, which contribute to the Chinese comparative advantage. The German and in general of the European Union cannot blame their declining comparative advantage. It's because of the risk from China. Actually, this is because of the war in Ukraine and the capitals flow away to the United States. That's industries also flow away to the United States. So the German and Europeans suffered from that and then blame China, which is unfair. Just to follow up on the interesting example of uh, electronic vehicles, uh, Professor Buchner, um, we see private Chinese uh, EV companies are establishing what they call technology centers inside European continent, uh, which they are practicing in Europe for Europe uh, strategy, just like many German firms are practicing in China for China strategy. How do you see these new and vibrant developments in the business sphere uh, coming from uh, smart minds from both sides uh, trying to solve the problem? How much inspirations they can provide for the politicians to try to find some common ground? Well, it is a very interesting case because it has a number of pros, but it also has a number of cons. The pros are that we currently have a government that is very committed to fight climate change and everything that can help to reduce emissions is warmly welcome. On the other hand, in the European Union, no country is more dependent on the automotive industry than Germany and everything that challenges this backbone of the German economy is a major risk for the functioning of the German model. So as long as the German manufacturers have problems to compete with new competitors from Asia that have a larger scale or a higher investment or whatever the comparative advantage is, is we have to balance between the climate goals on the one hand and the risk yeah. for the German economy if this backbone is no longer competitive and that might cause a number of protectionist initiatives that yeah. are communicated to the Chancellor. Mm. Professor Wang, your thoughts on this? 
Well, it's very urgent for uh, the German side to uh, seek opportunities, not just in the name of the de-risk. From the German perspective, uh, firstly, uh, Trump come back to the possibility. Secondly, the investigation of the subsidies of the, from the European uh, Commission about the e-vehicles will be finalized in July. So should hurry up the process of the engage, re-engage with China in this regard. Thirdly, the, the, the appearances are worse in the bigger companies, uh, big countries in the West. Even next year, the investment and also uh, economic growth is uh, below zero. So I think the Chinese market is very crucial for Germany. So not in the name of the de-risk of something uh, follow Americans uh, and the influence. We need to build more healthy and trust the relations between the two markets. Both of you have been talking about an election elsewhere in the world that will have an impact certainly on the world and certainly on what Germany is likely to experience in the near future and China as well. Now, given the fact that the Europeans are quite dependent on the security uh, with the US, uh, well, at the same time, competing with the United States in uh, economic and trade areas, how do you see the complexities that the German Chancellor is facing, political and geopolitical wise? Yes, we understand uh, the complexity of the German and even for the European Union, uh, because the, the world is also very complex, uncertainty. But compare the United States and Russia, which are major players in the world, European Union actually luckily to have the certain relations with China. Uh, yeah. Germany uh, now is a huge delegation, uh, even about uh, agriculture, uh, Minister of Agriculture, which uh, actually very seldom visit China. That means uh, the German also very concerned about uh, agriculture or the food safety, uh, security problems. Uh, security is about because of the rebellion of the uh, because of the law of support to Ukraine and the food. So uh, of the, the farmers in in the Germany also demonstrate and about the safety because about the uh, the food safety supply chain in Africa in the world. So that's reason I think that we have the new areas of co further cooperate. And even for digital this time, for the digital and the new uh, technologies, the ministers for China-German economic community with the dialogue, which also can seek more uh, opportunities in the new front, like uh, the digital and the green transformation? Well, the situation is relatively simple. The war in Ukraine increases the dependency of Russia towards China, and it increases the dependency of the European Union and Germany towards the United States. And this has negative consequences for the economic development. And in times in which China also faces economic problems, the best possible solution would be that this war in Ukraine ends and we can concentrate on the recovery of our economy and in improve our economic ties and develop strategies to deal with challenges ahead like a new government in the United States. So the best possible thing China could do, and I think this will be a strong message by the German Chancellor, is to use its leverage and it use its weight. And if this would come to an end, we could happily recover our economies, become the beneficial sides of partnership and have a more relaxed stance, whatever happens in the United States, if it maybe moves in the direction of isolationism or protectionism that we have already seen with the Inflation Reduction Act that as Professor Wang rightly said, massively harmed the economy of the European Union and Germany in particular. So there's okay. a lot we could do to improve the situation. We see that the German colleagues is having a very tight time budget, particularly with the upcoming election results in the US. So Professor Wang, how do you see the urgencies that both sides apparently have China-Germany? to make this relationship work? Well, I agree with the uh, um, German um, colleagues said that we should stop this uh, crisis as soon as possible, either in the Ukraine and in the Middle East. Uh, China actually is uh, uh, very helpfully to contribute with that kind of scenario. President Xi is visiting France uh, and also um, 
uh, Hungary, which is the presidency of the European Union for the next half of this year, and also uh, Serbia. China also helped to contribute uh, with Switzerland to be the host of the third round of the international conference on Ukraine, which uh, will include Russia. The previous two uh, without Russia actually is empty talking. So it's very crucial to, uh, to make the Russia and the Ukraine and the European and the US uh, to talk each other. So talk, uh, otherwise, you know, cannot have a ceasefire. Well, before we go, um, I would like to ask you if there is something that can be prioritized and easily done in order to create a better atmosphere and kind of spirit from both sides for cooperation, what would that be? And what would the area that you think would suggest to your leader uh, when they are engaging with one another? He's going there to sell the message for a better mutual understanding and to prepare for the challenges ahead. And all these personal visits help to get a better understanding. This would be my recommendation. My advice actually to the Chinese government is to open more market to the European uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, like our visa uh, free uh, policy, uh, to verify of the uh, comprehensive investment treaty actually after elections in the European Parliament, which is very helpful from the Chinese side to do first. Okay. Wang Yiwei, Ulrich Bruckner, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us.